Welcome to another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint Podcast. Today, my guest is Kevin Ellis, better known as the Bone Coach, who is a certified integrative nutrition health coach, podcaster, YouTuber, bone health advocate, and is the founder of BoneCoach.com. Through a unique three-step process and world-class coaching programs, he and his team have helped people with osteopenia and osteoporosis in over 1,500 cities around the world get confident in their stronger bone plans. His mission is not just to help over 1 million people around the globe build stronger bones. It's also to help our children and grandchildren prevent osteoporosis and other diseases in the future so that they can lead long, active lives. Sounds like what we talked about on the show. So you're a great guest. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Stephanie, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me, how did you get started on this journey with helping women and men with osteopenia and osteoporosis? Well, I'll tell you, it's usually not uh, a lot of people, when I, when I talk about bone health and osteoporosis, and they learn that I was diagnosed with osteoporosis at an early age at 30, they're yeah. shocked by that. I mean, I was shocked too at that time, yeah. but it's usually, yeah. that's usually not the case. Um, and really, I would say my health journey started way before I was even diagnosed with osteoporosis. When my mother was five months pregnant with me, my father was told he had cancer. Mm. Uh, he was a Marine in Vietnam. He did 22 months there, survived combat, but he came home ended up getting cancer from Agent Orange and he passed away when I was about two months old. Um, and so my entire life as I was growing up, uh, I, I had this fear that I was going to follow in his footsteps down that sure, path and, you sure. know, pass away at an early age. And he passed away at 35 years old. So uh, when I, when I got into my late twenties, I, I started having all these health issues and I wasn't sure what was going on. Like I had high stress, poor sleep, um, a chronic fatigue. Some days I could barely even get out of bed. Um, and it was just, uh, it was affecting all aspects of my life, my relationships, mm -hmm. uh, just everything. And then I was diagnosed with celiac disease. So I had been malabsorbing nutrients for many, mm -hmm. many years. Um, and then I was subsequently diagnosed with osteoporosis. And at the time, you know, being a 30 year old male being told you have osteoporosis, like, I was shocked. What? Yeah. <laughs> I know. All right. I didn't, I didn't believe it at that point in time, but I, I did, but I didn't. So I went and I got a second opinion and they confirmed, in fact, it was osteoporosis. And when I first was told I had osteoporosis, it wasn't even like, here's your detailed plan. It was a letter in the mail that said, you have osteoporosis, mm. go on a gluten-free diet. And that was it. And I realized along the way, you know, at that point in time, when I was diagnosed, I had to kind of face my future and, and realize my father passed away at a really young age. I don't want to be in the same position where I leave my kids growing up without a father. That was probably the biggest reason for me to, to get a uh, plan in place and do the research mm -hmm. and consult with all these people and finally start doing all the right things. I needed to do to improve my health and my bones. And I figured all that stuff out and I learned a lot along the way. And I brought in some amazing people to help me with that. Um, and that is kind of how I, all this came to be bone coach and bonecoach.com and all that stuff is because I realized it's not the average 30 year old male that is told they have osteoporosis. It's right. the woman 40, 50, yep. 60 plus that gets this diagnosis, they get a DEXA scan as a check in the box, they find out they have it, and then they're presented with four options, calcium, vitamin D, go for a walk, and take a bone drug. And I can tell you right now- mm -hmm. Usually it's just take a bone drug, yeah. <laughs> or it could be that, yeah. I can tell you right now, that's woefully inadequate. It's not enough. That's not the right plan. So that's, that's why I'm so passionate about what we do now. I love your story, and you're right. I think the average, you know, I don't know what the average age of someone is who's diagnosed with osteopenia, but you're probably right. It's women in her mid forties, fifties, whatnot. However, I'd like to go back to you. I didn't ask you ahead of time if I was allowed to ask personal questions, but, yeah. <laughs> but your story does provoke some questions. So did you consider yourself at the time of diagnosis, pretty healthy? Like, do you, did you feel like you were eating healthy and were you working out? I mean, exercising regularly, like, or not? I'm just, well, so I'm just curious as to your lifestyle at the time also. Yes. Yeah, so so even, even backing up, like when I was younger, uh, before, because my father was a Marine, I wanted to be, be a Marine also. So I worked out really intensely. I got a great foundation of exercise and strength training and resistance training. And I actually kind of wanted to be a bodybuilder at the same time too, when I was a little younger. So I already had this amazing foundation of exercise and sure. fitness and things like that from a young age, 17, 18 years old. And I continued to build on that into my early twenties when I went into the Marines 
Uh, and I, at one point I was about, I don't know, about 200 pounds and I, you know, pretty, a lot of muscle at that yeah. point in time. Uh, but then I got to the point where later in my twenties, um, even though I was still eating healthy, I was still, there was alcohol consumption. Sure. I had smoked cigarettes for a, an extended period of time, which gosh, if there's one thing I regret doing, I don't have many regrets, but that is one of them. Um, you know, there are other things I know that were contributing to that. And sure. then I just, I started going downhill because I didn't know I had celiac disease yeah. at that point in time. So even though I was trying to do things that I thought were healthy, I still wasn't, you know, I still wasn't where I needed to be. And my health was just continuing to downward, uh, downward spiral. So sure, sure. My next question is, as my listeners know, I mean, I own a hormone optimization clinic. And so I'm very curious as to know if you found someone on your team that did check your testosterone level <laughs> around uh -huh. the time of diagnosis, was that something that you eventually did explore also? Yes, uh, that was lower testosterone. That was an issue at that point in time. We were able to raise those levels, which is great. Um, and, and I mean, hormones play such an important mm -hmm. role in your health, in your bones, uh, but then also the nutrients that you take in and are mm -hmm. able to take in, those are going to help with your hormones and your bodily Absolutely. functions also. So, you know, if I have this secondary cause or this other uh, issue, uh, that has not been addressed, that's obviously going to come into my health and affect everything else there. Therefore. Yep. Agreed. My story's similar to yours. I wasn't diagnosed with osteoporosis, but I had infertility. And I also found out I, I should say, I didn't have celiac disease. My celiac blood tests were positive. My biopsy was negative. So thankfully mm -hmm. I wasn't in a state of, you know, super malabsorption like you. However, I was headed in that direction and I haven't touched gluten sense, and I was able to conceive. I did need some hormone replacement therapy like progesterone and whatnot. So our, our stories are a little bit similar in that we did, uh -huh. it sounds like, work to try to get to the root cause of the problem and use all the tools that functional medicine um, has for us. So let's, let's kind of define what osteopenia and osteoporosis are for our listeners. And how would they know if they had that? Yeah. And, I, and I'd like to even start with just the statistics too around yes, sure. osteopenia, osteoporosis, because it's, it's a silent condition, mm -hmm. right? It's, you can have osteopenia and osteoporosis and not know it. Tell uh, you, and, a, and a lot of times, a, yeah, curb and break your ankle. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of times people don't realize they have it until of, of the point of fracture and then they go get the bone density scan. So uh, we've got approximately what 10 million Americans have osteoporosis. We've got another 44 million that have low bone density. We've got up to one in two women and up to one in four men will break a bone in their lifetime due to osteoporosis. Mm. For women, we've got the incidence of low bone density is greater than that of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer combined. Say that right? again. That's Say that again. Huge. The incidence yeah. of low bone density is greater than that of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer combined. So that's huge. That's huge. Yep. Right. Uh, six months uh, after hip fracture, a lot of times people hear about hip fracture as being, you know, one of the biggest things that they want to avoid, or maybe they saw that in their mother or their grandparent or something like that. Only 15% of patients can walk across a room unaided after a hip fracture. And then every year we've got about 300,000 hip fracture patients. Mm. You've got one quarter of them end up in a nursing home and half of them never regain that previous function. So these are, these are pretty alarming statistics, but again, most people don't know they have it right. until the point of a fracture or something like dun, that. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. So I am always about being on the side of prevention and not reaction, especially because, you know, working with thousands of people at this point and having, you know, people that have anywhere from relatively no health issues and no fractures to five to 10 or more fractures, I can tell you, when you get to that point, uh, everybody that I talk to at that point, just wishes it was on the side of prevention, uh, mm -hmm. not reaction. So let's go ahead and define what is yeah, osteoporosis, please. right? Literally, it means porous bone. And it's a condition that's characterized by either not enough bone formation, excessive bone loss, or it's a combination of the two of those things. And both your bone density and osteoporosis, both your bone density and your bone quality are reduced. And that is what increases your risk of fracture. So the way you find out you have osteoporosis is through what's called a DEXA scan. That's dual energy 
X-ray absorptionometry. It's a painless test, kind of like an X-ray, but very, very low levels of radiation. You lay down on the machine, the machine does a scan, and it tells you your bone mineral density, the actual mineral content of your bone. And then what it does is it generates a score. And that score is called the T-score, right? The T-score tells you how much your bone mass differs from the bone mass of an average healthy 30-year-old adult approximately. And if your score, your T-score is in between plus one, minus one, zero, somewhere in there, that's considered normal and healthy. If it's minus one to minus 2.5, that's considered osteopenia or low bone mass, which is like a precursor to osteoporosis. Yep. And then negative 2.5 and lower, so negative 2.6, negative 2.7, so on and so forth, that's considered osteoporosis. And the greater that negative number becomes, the more severe the osteoporosis is. And yeah. what, what's happening here is most women, that's usually who's getting these done as a check in the box, 50s, mm -hmm. 60s, right? But in my opinion, that's too late, right? I, I would so much rather prefer people looking at this and getting a baseline in their sure. 30s and their 40s. So we have an objective data point that we can, from which we can monitor future changes because, yep. um, and we'll get into the causes and things like that in just a minute, but you, you may also have not built up enough bone in your younger years, which could be a, a big contributor to that too. I, I'm going to echo what you said. I think that's wise advice, uh, especially for women who are listening, uh, who may be younger, who aren't cycling regularly. So to get that bone density early. So that's a red flag, right? That your body's telling you something's not right. So obviously find a practitioner who can help you get cycling. But I've seen women in their thirties come to me with fractures. None of their doctors seem to care that they hadn't cycled in years. And I, you know, and I'm saying, this is not this is not normal. <laughs> right. So, yeah. and we've been able to help many of those patients, but again, if you're listening what Kevin's saying is why not screen earlier, right. To figure out if you have this condition versus wait until you're 50 and you have lost a lot of bone. And then I know the, the, the point behind this podcast is to be encouraging to help patients know that they can build the bone, but like you're saying, it's easier to build it earlier <laughs> yeah. in life. So yes. Yeah. So absolutely. And, and I would say too, you know, we, We've seen people that are in their late twenties. Um, a lot of times, the loss of hormones early on, that mm -hmm. or steroid excluded. use. A lot of times, that's what at least what I see. A lot of steroid use will drive hormone levels down and then thus impact bone density negatively. So. And, and let's even talk about the peak bone mass thing too, because yeah, a lot yeah. of people, especially younger people, and if you've got kids, right? You got young kids that you're listening to this. You've got young kids, or you're listening. You've got grandkids. This is really, really important to understand. Up to 90% of your bone mass is put on by the time you turn age 18. And the remaining 10% approximately is going to fill in by the time you turn 30. So by the time you turn 30, your bucket is about as full as it's going to be, right? So if when you were younger, you had poor diet nutrition, you led a sedentary lifestyle, you had an eating disorder, mm -hmm. you took certain medications, um, you know, you smoked or drank excessively. Hello, I fell into that category. Um, so there are a lot of things that can contribute to you not achieving peak bone mass, uh, and starting with a full bucket. So if you've, if you've got kids or you yourself are not at that point yet, um, you make Fill sure up you're the doing, bucket. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you're doing the right things now. It's so critical, critical in those, especially, you know, 10, 10, 12, 13, 14, right in that age when people are really growing or growing their bones, when kids are really growing their bones, we want to make sure we're doing the right things for them. Yeah, good points. Good points. Well, let's move on to causes. And you've alluded to some of those like malabsorption of nutrients. We've talked about low hormones, but tell us what major causes exist in your opinion. Yeah. So there, a lot of people don't know this. There are multiple types of osteoporosis, right? There's primary osteoporosis. That's typically related to a decrease in estrogen and other hormones, right? As in postmenopausal women, estrogen has a protective effect on bone as do some of those other hormones, mm -hmm. but as those levels decrease, as they do during menopause, that's going to cause an increase in the activity level of cells that break down bone. But then there's a whole nother cause of osteoporosis that's called secondary osteoporosis. And that that's where bone loss occurs as the result of some, you know, behaviors, conditions, disorders, sure. diseases, and medications. And a lot of times, if somebody is younger, especially 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they have or had a secondary cause that needs to be addressed. Yep. But I also want to make a point that just because you're a postmenopausal woman, we can't just chalk that. I hear this all the time. You know, it's just hormones. It's a natural part of aging. Um, 
no, there, there can be an, another cause that has to be addressed. So we mm-hmm. can't just make an assumption. We have to make objective decisions. Super, super important. Awesome. So how do you feel the standard treatment protocol for osteoporosis is working? Do you feel like that's enough? <laughs> or let's well, maybe share what it is. We've sure. talked a little bit about that too, but share what it is and why you feel a better approach exists. Yeah. So, I mean, the standard recommendation for most people is take some calcium, uh, take some vitamin D yeah, and those are both two important nutrients, right? They're both really important. Vitamin D is a critical nutrient for your health, for your bones. Um, and I'll interject and say, and rarely is K2 recommended to take, I'll say, I mean, doctors are not even there yet and we'll, oh, we can talk about, you, but yeah, yeah, but continue, continue. We can talk about that one in a minute. Cause that's not even acknowledged <laughs> no, in the conventional no. medical world. Um, no. But calcium, obviously, it's a primary mineral constituent of your bones. That's important, yes. Mm -hmm. But the other option that's presented is a bone medication. Mm -hmm. And this is not like these bone medications, they're not like taking an aspirin. They have a dramatic effect on bone physiology. So I'm I'm just going to outline briefly the different types of these drugs, like the different categories of these drugs. And then what some of the generic, some of the names that people have probably heard of them. And then what, what happens when you take these drugs, right? So uh, there are anti-resorptive drugs. That's one category. And these drugs are designed to slow down the activity level of cells that break down bone, right? They don't address the root cause, but their job is to affect the activity level of cells that break down bone. Uh, And that would be uh, two types of drugs, bisphosphonates, mm-hmm. which include things like Fosamax is probably yeah. the most, the one most people hear of. Sure. And then rank ligand inhibitors, which is called Prolia. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those are probably the two most common ones people will hear. And safety and efficacy of, of bisphosphonates specifically, not really known beyond five years. Uh, and then also one of the really important things to understand about bisphosphonates is that as we're going about our daily lives and, and we're doing activities, we're working out, it's, this is normal for every single person. Your bones are remodeling and it's a coupled process. You have to have some bone breakdown sure, and you have to have some bone formation. That's what makes stronger, healthier bones. Um, so when we're doing exercises and things like that, you're going to start to get these tiny little micro cracks and fractures and like tiny little micro cracks in your bones. And what happens is there's these cells in the bones that send out a signal and it says, Hey, we need to come, you know, fix and repair this. So these bone breakdown cells called the osteoclasts come in and they scoop out those little micro cracks. And then what happens is the bone building cells come right in behind and fill it in with stronger, healthier bone. Those are called osteoblasts. Yep. When you're taking these medications though, sometimes that activity level of cells can be slowed down to too much to where you're not actually scooping out those tiny little micro cracks, right? And then you start to accumulate those over time. And that lead that can lead to, you know, bones that are that are not as strong as, as you may think. More brittle bones yeah, than you started with. Yeah. Right. So and that's yeah. one type of medication. That's the anti The other type of medication is an anabolic. Okay. And these are your your Forteo, your Avinity. Um, you know, there are other medications that fall into that category. And the purpose of these medications is to build bone and build it faster. And yes, it will increase your bone density and your bone quality. That's what these drugs are designed to do. But it's, uh, and a lot of times they're recommended if somebody is coming in and they've already got multiple fractures or poor quality bone, like I, I mentioned, you know, five, 10 fractures or more, that's usually a situation where one of these drugs would be recommended. Um, and what happens though, is you take these medications for a certain period of time, and then you have to follow them with another medication, right? So you're, it's not like you just take one and you're done with it. You have to follow it. So these are just things, and there are risks and side effects that go along with these two. So these are the things most people don't understand when they're sitting in office in a 15 minute appointment, they're given their DEXA scan. And then they're said, Hey, take this medication. It's going to help you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold the phone. Let's pause right here. And let's get a little bit more objective information to make an empowered decision moving forward. Yep. Agreed. 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 So speaking of getting more information, let's go back to the association between gut health and bone health. Mm-hmm. So talk about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, gut, gut health has a major connection to, to bone health. I mean, as, as probably the, the easiest thing to point out is 
we're not what we eat. We are what we absorb, right? So sure. your body and your bones can only become what you're able to break down, absorb and assimilate back into your body. So um, I like to tell people to think of their body and their bones as being like plants. Um, and what most people do is they focus so much on the salads, the smoothies, the supplements that they fail to consider the soil. And our gut is like the soil, right? You, you absorb almost everything here. So when you take in nutrients into your mouth or supplements into your mouth, you start to break that food down into smaller pieces. That food makes its way into your stomach where it's churned in this acidic mix to break it down even further. And then it makes its way to your small intestine which is our soil, right? That's where nutrients are broken down to their smallest form to be absorbed by us, the plants. But in order to absorb anything, you have to have roots in your soil. And these roots are called villi. And they're these tiny little hair-like projections that are you know, responsible for absorbing nutrients from the food you eat. So they absorb these nutrients and then they shuttle them throughout your body so where they can travel where they're needed. So it, whether it's healing a cut on your hand, growing your hair or your fingernails, or in this case, rebuilding stronger bones. And the job of these roots are, are villi, so important. The total surface area they use to absorb nutrients is the size of a football field. Isn't that Pretty amazing? amazing? Yeah. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Yep. But when you don't have good gut health and that's not optimal, you're not going to properly break down your food. And if you can't properly break down your food, those nutrients aren't going to be available. Your, your villi aren't going to be able to absorb them. And your body and your bones are going to be starved of those nutrients. And that was happening to me. Literally. A perfect I, example of that. I tell, so with celiac disease, I mean, I'm, you're probably listening, but if you're watching the video, <laughs> I tell patients those little microvilli literally wear down to little stubs and they're just, uh -huh. they're not able to absorb the nutrients. And that's where Kevin was, which is why, you know, he could have been eating healthy, but if he wasn't absorbing the nutrients, then the nutrients weren't getting in, into the cells and helping to build the bones. So that's we do, true. and that's the purpose of really getting the scope for definitive diagnosis of celiac is to really see, okay, they biopsy the tissue to see, are those microvilli worn down? So mine weren't worn down yet. <laughs> Kevin's yeah. were. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the treatment of which, right, in our case, is to help rebuild them was to get off the gluten, which was damaging those villi. But there are other foods that can also damage the microvilli. It's not just the gluten is the only inflammatory food. There are lots of inflammatory foods, um, which is really topic of chapter one of my book, Your Longevity Blueprint, where we test patients for food sensitivities. We run stool tests. We try to assess absorption okay. and we can also test nutrients. I don't know if that's something you do as part of your protocol, but we can test yeah. to see nutrient status to see what supplements patients really do need to be taking. So I'm, Absolutely. I'm glad you're talking about that association or connection between gut health and bone health. Absolutely. So, so do you feel like there's a perfect diet for osteoporosis? Oh, you know, people hate when I hate my response to this. Um, you know, there's no perfect diet for any single group of people, right? If we're talking to multiple people at the same time, regardless of health condition, there's no perfect diet for every single person that, that we're all biochemically and genetically unique individuals, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to respond to different foods and supplements and dietary approaches differently. Um, but with that in mind, I would say that you know, anti-inflammatory diet, making sure you're getting healthy proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you can include vegetables. Yes, there are some fruits you can include healthy fats, you know, some of the, I never like saying that there are specific foods that can work for every single person, but there are some that I've seen that do pretty well with a lot of people. So first one yep. would be, uh, I love wild sockeye salmon, mackerel, uh, sardines, herring. Those are all fantastic, but the ones I really like are the ones that have the bones in them and are canned. Uh, I really, mm -hmm. really like those ones. And the reason for that is when you have the bones in, they're not hard pokey bones that are going to hurt your mouth. They almost melt right. in your mouth. Yeah, they which, do. Yeah. And, and they have all the nutrients that your bones need, not just calcium. It has all the other nutrients in the right proportions. Sure. Right. So that's super, super awesome. And then it has protein. Your bones are 50% protein by volume. So they need, you know, constant supply of amino acids. Uh, these, you know, salmon and, and sardines and mackerel and all those things, yep. great source of protein. And then they also have omega-3s. And anything that contributes to inflammation in the body is going to fuel or accelerate bone loss. Omega-3s are dampeners of inflammation. So yep. I love, I love that. I think that's a, a great... Uh, trio of nutrients that are there in uh, those fish. 
Plus they have vitamin D. Yeah. Fish are a good source of vitamin D. Yep. Vitamin D, vitamin D is another source. Yeah. Um, Coconut oil. I really do like coconut oil considered one of the healthiest foods on the planet, obviously for a lot of different conditions. Um, in bones, it can help with not just the protection against bone loss, but also in the actual improvement of bone structure, which is great. Uh, but then also you've got the MCT, uh, there are medium chain triglycerides inside coconut oil, right? We call them MCTs. MCTs are metabolized differently than other fats. They're going to go straight to the liver. They're converted instantly into energy and ketones, which are going to be a clean burning fuel source for the body. But the other thing I like about coconut oil is that we were just talking about digestive issues. Coconut oil has antimicrobial and antifungal effects, Yep. right? Close to 50% of the fatty acids in coconut oil are lauric acid. And when the body digests lauric acid, it forms a substance called monolaurin. And both lauric acid and monolaurin can help fight those bad bugs, the pathogens, the same bacteria that causes staph infection, C. diff, and the same candida yeast that causes oral thrush. So I really, really do like coconut oil. And then one of my favorite leafy greens is arugula. The same cruciferous (laughs) cruciferous family of vegetables as broccoli and kale, rich in potassium, folate, vitamin C, and this is my favorite one, bioavailable calcium. All of those are important for your bone health. So even though I don't like the plastic clamshells when you go to the grocery store, I really do not like those. But that's what they package arugula in most of the time. Mm -hmm. And if you get one of those three ounce clam shells, that's got, and you could saute it down. So it's not as big of an amount, but that's got about 200 milligrams of bioavailable calcium in them, uh, in there. And unlike spinach, which is a common green that a lot of people use. And I never, I never bash, you know, never really bash specific foods because Some people can tolerate it. Some people can still break down and degrade uh, oxalates, but spinach is high in oxalates. So when somebody looks at a container in the grocery store of spinach and they see, wow, spinach is really high in calcium, that calcium is actually not bioavailable. Okay. So uh, it's bound up with oxalate. So if you have a hard time breaking down and degrading oxalate, uh, some some indicators of that could be that you've got digestive issues, uh, digestive issues, kidney stones, kidney stones arthritis, yeah. arthritis, joint pain. Those can be Gout. some indicators. Yeah. 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 Um, you would want to swap that spinach for the arugula. So those are some of my favorites. There are a couple other ones too, but I think, you know, that's a good overview of just some, some different foods that could be helpful. As arugula more stimulates digestion. So yes. again, back to coming full circle, which you absorbing nutrients. So really a power, power food, I would say superfood. So just to summarize what you just said, essentially increase oily fish, coconut oil, and then maybe substitute, have your leafy greens, but maybe substitute arugula instead of the kale or the spinach all the time. I'm good with rotating. I think rotation is just wise. for Yeah. 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 And, and for arugula too, you had just touched on this for digestion. Arugula is one of the last bitter foods that we have in our modern American diets for the most part. Like if you're incorporating it, And why do we need bitters? Bitters are going to stimulate uh, bile, which is really, really important. That's going to help. That's also going to help fight those bad bugs and pathogens and things Mm -hmm. like that. It's going to help with your digestion. So uh, that's a great one. And actually, I do want to point out vitamin C rich foods. Sure, uh, sure. Because that is super, super important. Vitamin C is it's a key nutrient for bone health. Obviously, it's good for a lot of other uh, health conditions and things like that. But the body needs vitamin C to form blood vessels, cartilage, muscle, and even collagen and bones. So remember, bones are made of this collagen protein matrix upon which minerals are laid. And what happens when you're taking in vitamin C is it's stimulating pro-collagen, it's enhancing collagen synthesis, and it's stimulating something called alkaline phosphatase activity, which is a marker for osteoblast bone building cell formation, which is pretty cool. Right. So there are plenty of whole food sources of vitamin C too, but I love incorporating vitamin C rich foods in a plan. And they are readily available fresh this summer, this season. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Although this episode won't launch till the fall, but yeah, listeners get the point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great advice. Let's circle back around to exercise. Mm-hmm. So you, you even alluded to the fact that you had been really just kind of trained since a young age to <laughs> incorporate exercise. You were um, even training maybe to be a bodybuilder. So what role does exercise play in bone health? And let's kind of bring this also back to the menopausal demographic here too, as far yeah. as what they can be doing to try to help with building. Absolutely. Bone. Absolutely. So 
exercise super important role in bone health. You need two different types of stimuli for your bones. You need muscle pulling on bone and you need impact. And the most effective interventions are going to use one or both of those in combination. And what happens is when you have muscle pulling on bone, you have this mechanical signal that's sending a chemical signal that's telling those bones to become stronger. So that's really important. And then a lot of times I, you know, when you're in the office and you get told you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, you're told, Hey, go for a walk right? Do some weight bearing exercise. I will tell you right now that walking is great to incorporate in your plan. It's great for your health, but that's not the only thing, right? That's not going to be enough. As long as you don't have an underlying condition or health, you know, thing contributing to bone loss still, it could help you maintain, but it will not be helping you build bone. So okay, what, so what helps, what are the exercises that incorporate muscle pulling on bone then? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, we have to do muscle uh, strength training, resistance training, uh, you have to do those things. They have to be part of your plan. You can use heavy resistance bands. You can use dumbbells, barbells, things like that. Okay. Um, and then we want to focus on uh, major compound movements too. Uh, you know, there was a- uh, Translate, translate. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Dr. Belinda Beck and her team have done some amazing work with this uh, in Australia. And they had something called the lift more trial where they did overhead presses, deadlifts, squats, chin-ups with drop landings that were all safe and effective for the people they use in their studies that showed, you know, positive impact on bone and okay. those major movements, right. Yeah, that I just okay. walk through, those are going to be really, really helpful for, for bone. Uh, and now here's the, here's the part that I don't want people just going and watching a video on YouTube on how to deadlift and then going to try to crank this out, get somebody to evaluate your body mechanics, make sure you know how to do these things properly before you go jump into them. Uh, but you need to work your way up to that five to 10 rep uh, intensity range, because that's what's going to be most effective and most helpful. Uh, so if you're just starting out, you don't want to get really intense and be in that rep range uh, until you've got your form down. And the last thing I want to note about uh, exercise and bone health is that it's not like going to the gym one or two times or two weeks is going to have this dramatic impact on your bone health. It's not like, oh, the harder I push right now, or, sure. you know, the more impact I give this, the better it's going to be. I can tell you that's not the case. Bone remodeling is a slow process. Mm -hmm. There's a reason bone density scans are only done every one, one and a half, two years. Got to play the long game here, people. Yeah. You got to play the long <laughs> game. You do not play the short game because playing the short game leads to injury. Uh, so play the long game, be consistent, be, be easy on yourself too, right? Don't be too hard on yourself on this journey. Um, and I do want to point out one other thing about exercise is that there are also exercises that are non-weight bearing. Okay. So weight bearing exercise is where the body is, you know, your body, your muscles, your bones are upright. They're working against gravity and it's placing this good kind of stress on your bones. Then there's non-weight bearing exercise. This would be your cycling or your paddling and canoeing, your swimming, swimming. your water therapy, that kind of stuff. Uh, and those are not putting the stress that's needed on your bones. Now I'm not saying if you really enjoy those things, do them. Like if it, if going for a ride on your bike reduces your stress and makes you happy, same thing. With swimming. Yeah, you, yeah. you love hanging out with your family in the pool. And like, that's a memory that you have. Fantastic. Do it, but don't count that as your only exercise. You have to have a resistance in there too. Yep. Good advice. Great advice. All right. So is fracture guaranteed just because someone has a low bone density? Like does um, everyone who have low bone density end up getting a fracture? You know, a million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. Cause this is, this is what, uh, when you go get that bone density scan that we talked about at the beginning, right. It's going to give you one piece of information, which is your bone density, the actual mineral content of your bone. What it doesn't tell you is in most situations is the other part of that picture. There's something called bone quality. So bone density is the mineral content of your bone. Bone quality is how that bone is organized the structural integrity, the microarchitecture of that bone, both of those things combine to create bone strength. So a lot of times people only have part of the picture. Uh, so bone quality is a really important part of that picture. It's also the reason why there are times when I've seen people that would technically be osteopenia by their T-score, but maybe they've fractured multiple times, 
right? They're in the negative ones, but maybe they've fractured multiple times. That's an indicator of really poor bone quality. Sure. But then I've seen people that have a bone density score of negative threes that have never fractured before, mm -hmm. right? And that's another bone quality is playing a role there. So it's not, it's not guaranteed that just because you have low bone density, you're going to have a fracture. But what I always encourage people to do is, again, be on the side of prevention, not reaction. If you've realized you have low bone density, don't wait. You don't want to wait to have more bone loss because it's, it is a lot easier to slow and stop and prevent more bone loss than it is to build bone once you lose it. Both are possible. You can build bone strength at any age. It just becomes more challenging the older you get and the more bone you lose. There are fewer cells involved in that process. That process becomes less efficient. So we just want prevention is, is the most important thing. And then you may also be wondering, well, how do I know what my bone quality is? Well, there's, an, there's a software that's an add-on to that bone density scan. Not every, not every DEXA scan has this, right? Only select facilities in, in certain areas. And you can look it up and find it, but it's called Trabecular Bone Score, TBS. And what this does is when you get your DEXA scan, it's an add-on and it's going to give you that full picture. So you can understand in one scan what your bone density and your bone quality is. Uh, and then there's also another technology. It's, it's more prevalent in Europe. It's kind of up and coming in the US. It's had a slower adoption here, which is kind of standard, I think. Um, but this technology is called REMS or Echolite. It's radio frequency, echographic, multi-spectrometry technology. And what it does is it does an ultrasound of your bones and it tells your bone density, your bone quality, and gives you a five-year major osteoporotic fracture risk prediction. Uh, so there are tools out there to understand the full picture, um, but that's, those are some helpful things there. Do you ever recommend urine bone resorption testing? Have you seen any yes. of that? Oh, yeah. I love, yes. Okay. So <laughs> we talked about the bone density test, right? When you get that and you are in that office and you're just shocked, oh my gosh, you know, I have this, I must be losing bone right now. That's an assumption, right? One single bone density scan cannot tell you if you're still actively losing bone. That's where these markers come into play. They're called bone turnover markers. Yep. And they can tell you the activity level of cells that are breaking down and building up your bones. So there's one test, uh, which is the most sensitive marker for bone resorption. It's called the CTX or CT low peptide test. That mm -hmm. one is a, that one's a blood test, serum test. Uh, but then there's also an NTX uh, which is an NT low peptide. And there's a, a blood test and a urine test. If you're going to do the urine test, I would do the second catch of the day for that second urine of the day. And then we, anytime we get the bone resorption side of the picture, we also want to get the bone, uh, the bone formation side of the picture too. And the other, mar the markers for bone formation are P1NP. That's pro collagen type one and terminal pro peptide. And that is the most sensitive marker for bone formation. But there are also some other markers. There's osteocalcin that you can look at. And then there's also bone specific alkaline phosphatase. So if you get a comprehensive metabolic panel uh, in that CMP, you're probably also going to have your alkaline phosphatase run. Mm -hmm. And if you see that number comes back and it's elevated, there could be, you know, different fractions basically indicating something's going on there. So you yep. can, it could be from uh, an elevation in the gut or in the bone or, you know, some other part of the body. Liver. So yeah, yeah. yeah, the liver too. So um, that that's really important to make sure you have those labs. And there are other important labs. We talked about celiac. Um, getting a CBC is always important. There are some other ones too that are really important there too. I used to use the uh, urine, I guess they are, I, I think it was called the NTX, what you mentioned. I haven't run it in a while, so I couldn't remember what it was called, but yeah. for many patients, because they had to wait, right, one, two, however many years for insurance to cover the bone density repeat, we could at least use this urinary test to track progress. And they would be so encouraged that, okay, you know, this is, my markers are improving. I'm on the right track. I'm going to continue to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I think there's good utilization of those sort of tests in the interim waiting for the repeat. <laughs> Absolutely. Because yep. you do not want to be in a situation where, like we talked about a DEXA scan is a lagging indicator of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of improvement or of, of not improving. And that's going to happen a year, year and a half, two years down the road. You do not want to be 
you know, doing things and then just hoping right. that, that what you're doing is either moving you in the right direction or maybe it's not moving you in the right direction. So that's where these bone turnover markers can come in, where you can look at them again, especially if you get a baseline and you recognize that something is off there. Yep. And three to six months later, you run those again. Okay, wow, I saw that my bone, my bone resorption has come down significantly. That's fantastic. Um, and you just continue to monitor those things. It's not 100% perfect, but it's going to be probably your best near-term indicator or leading Agreed. indicator of success. Totally agreed. So let's get into uh, what a stronger bone plan looks like. I, I do want to get to supplements and nutrients kind of, and maybe we'll circle back around to the K2 also, yeah, Excuse sure. me, but kind of tell me in your opinion, what does a stronger bone plan look like? And maybe that's what you formulate with your, your clients and your stronger bone masterclass, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, high level, uh, I would say that the, anytime you're, you're putting together a plan for stronger bones, number one, you have to start with identifying and addressing the root cause issues of bone loss. Start with the root cause. Don't make assumptions, make objective decisions, right? That has to be the starting point. That, that comes with understanding what tests to order, um, how to ask for those tests and make sure you get them. A lot of times people go to their doctors and, you know, we're trying to do the, the right things for ourselves. We go on Google, Dr. Google, right? And you pull up all these tests and you come in and sometimes your doctor is going to, you know, turn those down or they're not going to run those. And that makes it really challenging. And you got to find someone who will, you have to find, losing my voice here today, you have to find proactive members of your team who will work with you, who will listen to you. A lot of conventional docs don't even have contracts with functional medicine labs, like the lab, for instance, we used to do the, the NTX, the so urine NTX marker we were talking about. You have to find someone, unfortunately, seek them out, seek out anti-aging, regenerative medicine, you know, functional medicine providers who do have contracts with these labs, who can run the tests that you need. Don't go home left discouraged. And just uh, this is a journey. You gotta find the right members of your team to help you. A hundred percent, hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, and like so, you gotta understand. Uh, once you get those tests ordered, now you have to understand what the results mean when they come back. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, when results come back, they're within a normal range. Normal is is extremely wide, right? And let's just use vitamin D for example, mm -hmm. right? The range if you're in the U.S., the range for vitamin D of normal is 30 to 100 NGML. If you're at 30, that's not going to be like, you need to be higher than that. If yeah. you're at 100, you need to, you need to be coming down from that. If you're over 100, that can contribute to bone loss also. Um, so, and that's just one example of one lab mm -hmm. result. Same thing with your, your blood calcium levels. If those are persistently over 10 uh, NGML, that can be an indicator that you've got potentially a parathyroid tumor if that's consistently over uh, that level. And, but it would be considered normal if you're just looking at your lab results. So you have to be able to spot these patterns and understand what's going on there. Um, that's really important. And then the second thing that people have to do is you have to nourish your body. You have to restore the raw materials and nutrients that you need for stronger, healthier bones, diet, digestion, absorption. Those three things, um, you have to, you know, it happens on three layers, right? The first layer is, are you taking in the right nutrients in the right amounts? The second layer is, are you actually absorbing those nutrients? If you right now have overt digestive issues, there's a good chance you have nutrient absorption issues, right? Even if you don't, celiac, even if you don't have overt digestive issues, you still, yeah. There still can, can be absorption. absorption issues. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, like with, with yeah. celiac. I didn't, I didn't have the digestive symptoms. I had more of the infertility. I had tachycardia and um, palpitations, right? So when you have inflammation in your gut, that can manifest in any organ system, not just your gut. It was my absolutely. cardiovascular, my nervous system, endocrine system for me. So Yeah. And, and celiac could be neuropathy, you know, all kinds of different things that are not necessarily your digestive health, but right. you could still have absorption issues. So that's the second layer. And the third layer is, are those nutrients making it to the cell level? And a lot of times, even if somebody's eating healthy, I'm eating paleo, I'm eating spinach and chicken at every meal. I'm going to tell you, you're still probably not getting the nutrients you need to support, you know, your bone health and, and even your body too. Yep. So uh, those three things have to have to line up. And then the last part of this has to be, you have to build strength of body, strength of mind, strength of bone, 
in a way that's going to prevent fracture and injury. So you need to reduce your stress. Uh, stress is going to contribute to bone loss. And I'm not just talking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, the stress of being chased by a lion, right? I know we've all kind of heard the fight or flight and stuff like that. And it's super important, but I'm talking about psychological stress too, fear, worry, emotionally charged mm -hmm. thoughts, family conflict, finances, keeping up with the perfect lives of the Joneses on social media. That's a big one. All of these things can contribute to and drive that fight or flight and stress response. And that's not going to be something you want to, you know, you, that's going to contribute yeah. to bone loss long-term. So because um, that does impact absorption of nutrients. And then what we, I talk about a lot on this podcast is that stress is your body's biggest hormone hijacker. Mm -hmm. So it will also rob you of progesterone and estrogen and testosterone which I guess I would add as the last step of a good bone building program would be getting your hormones checked, right. And optimizing 100%. them. And I know that's not the, the topic of this podcast, but I, I would encourage listeners listen to my interview of this uh, former CEO and founder of BioT, um, Dr. Gary Donovitz, where we talk all about the benefits of hormone pellets specifically. I know estrogen is important and progesterone is also very important. They're all important, but testosterone, I have seen build bone significantly in my patients. And I, I think when I started offering testosterone pellets is when I stopped doing that urine bone resorption <laughs> test, because I just saw improvement quickly. I just, and I was like, okay, I guess I don't need to <laughs> do this test as often on those patients. Yeah. I, I through, I've been in practice, I don't know, 12 years now. And I, I had never seen anything build bone density as quickly as testosterone pellets, I would see women who were osteoporosis. It, it took years, right? But then eventually moved to osteopenia and then to normal bone density. And I'm sure you see this also with your clients, but it is so exciting when they get their bone density and they bring it back to you and they say, oh my gosh, you know, my doctor told me there's nothing I can do. I'd never, you know, I never thought I would budge you know, these, these statistics, these percentages and look at the improvement. It's it just, huh, you know, brings tears to my eyes. It's, it's amazing. So I would say all of what you've mentioned and the optimizing hormones are, I would think very good pieces of a bone building plan. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the exercise piece and, and sleep, sleep is so important too. Um, if it's mm -hmm. pretty well documented, if you've got poor sleep, you're not sleeping well, that's going to reduce your bone quality also. So, um, and then the hormone optimization piece. Yes. Yep absolutely super, super important, um, you know, exercise right there with it too. So I'm sure you break all this down more in your stronger bones masterclass. So tell us about that. Tell us about your business and yeah, about that class. Yeah. So, I mean, bone coaches, uh, you can always find me over at bonecoach.com, but our business bone coach really focuses on walking people step-by-step step through a stronger bones plan. And, and we have programs, you know, three months, six month programs and some other programs that basically take people through this entire process that I yeah. just walked through in great, in great, Personalize detail. It. Sure, sure. in great detail. We add, you know, different support from different team members and things like that as you go through, but people leave those programs and they're confident in their plan or, or they come back to us a year, year and a half, two years later, we've got plenty of people that have improved their bone density and their bone strength. Uh, but you're not waking up every day after your diagnosis, wondering or worrying, right? How you're going to improve your health or your bones. You've already got that plan in place and you can focus on doing the things you love with the people you love most. But for the masterclass, that's where I always want people to start. And I'm going to give your, your listeners free access to it. So we, maybe we can link to this in the yeah, show notes absolutely. or something like that. And basically it's a free stronger bones masterclass. That's that process that I just walked through. I'm going to actually break that down. It's about a 50 minute masterclass. So set aside the time, watch it. You're, you're going to learn a lot and it's going to be really helpful for that. And if after you watch it, you're like, you know what? I do need a little bit of help. You can easily reach out. We'll tell you how to do that. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll give your, your people free access to that if they want. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, we will post link in the show notes. So I have two last questions. So one is, what is your bone density? We started off with you having osteoporosis uh, as, when you were 30. So where are you today? Yeah. Yeah. No. So the only, the only place I still have a uh, small amount of osteoporosis is my lower lumbar, but everywhere yeah. else, um, you know, everywhere else has had significant improvement and, and is no longer an issue there. And what I always tell people also is um, it depends on your starting point. Number one, Sure. Right. Your, your starting point is going to determine how much progress you can make in a given time period. And also the ability to address those root cause issues and make that progress and things like that. And my bones are different than your bones, 
right? And your bones are different than Susie's bones. So even though it's great to have, like for us, we have plenty of examples of people that improve their bone density and their bone strength, but their bones are different than your bones. So we need to focus on your root causes uh, and make sure we're addressing the things specifically for you and your body. So that's probably the most important point I would make on that one. Excellent advice. All right. As you know, I end every episode asking my guests their top longevity tip. Yeah. So I, I would just say, um, make sure that you're happy. Um, and everything that you do, just make sure that you're happy, surround yourself with good people, um, find the positive things in life. It's very easy. Like we're, we're wired as humans to focus on the negative. Uh, like that's just, you know, we're, we're geared to focus on those things. That's a survival mechanism, yep. but we need to, to actually intentionally focus on the positive things that are happening in our life, practice gratitude, be grateful for, for the moments you have and the things that we have um, every single day. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, today for coming on the show and sharing your passion on a topic that I think is so often neglected. We do need to focus on prevention. So I love that you're doing that. Thanks for sharing with my audience the, your free tips to improve bone health and help them live a longer, happier, healthier life at any age. This is great. Awesome. Thanks.